This is Gordon from Solar Eclipse Timer. In this video, I'm going to explain how and why the Titan version 1 hull and the Titan version 2 hull were both 5 inches thick, despite being designed and manufactured in a completely different way. How could the design profiles, predictions, and engineering be the same? I think you'll be surprised. To put the story together requires carefully analyzing the Coast Guard testimony of six engineers. From OceanGate, Tony Nissen and Phil Brooks. 2.21 times the design pressure. And Stockton did not want to do it for, for cost reasons. From Boeing, Mark Nagley, and from NASA, Justin Jackson. Uh, but the hole would have gotten thicker. You'd have to assess their impact to your structure and two engineers involved in the investigation, Bart Kemper and Don Kramer from the NTSB. This is just wrong. It's flat wrong. If you don't have requirements, how do you know you're good? Uh, sanded into both circumferential layers and longitudinal layers. Let me set up the background story first, and then watch to the end and I will lay it all out with some additional controversial information. Please comment because it helps the video get offered by the algorithm, and subscribe if you like my content. First, we have to figure out how they got to the thickness of 5 inches for the hull. Listen to this clip from a Boeing engineer, Mark Negley, followed by Ocean Gate's first director of engineering, Tony Nissen. As I previously stated, we now know that that final hull was 5 inches thick. Was Boeing involved in any conversations that reduced the thickness of the hull from 7 inches to 5 inches? We did a, you know, a feasibility study, a pre preliminary analysis, and came up with um, a seven-inch hole that we thought was potentially feasible. Um, that design utilized unnotched uh, composite uh, allowables and didn't consider uh, effects of defects or anything, you know, that would have been in a, a detailed configuration and analysis. And so that, you know, our expectation would be not that the hole got thinner. Uh, but the hole would have gotten thicker in order to uh, account for some of those potential defects or other considerations in the design. This is the Boeing feasibility study of Ocean Gate's deep sea submersible hull. We noted from this report that the hull was recommended to be 10 inches and then mm -hmm. optimized to 7 inches thick. Mm -hmm. However, as we know, the final design was 5 inches thick. Are you aware of how Ocean Gate got to the 5 inch thickness? That was Brian Spencer in Stockton. It was five inches thick before I joined the organization, and you, and you couldn't move it. And that, was, that was a hot topic of discussion with Dave Dyer and, and OceanGate. So it was Spencer Composites that determined a five-inch hole would be plenty strong, but they completely missed the strength needed by the design parameters, and Tony talks about the data from the Bahamas. The center of the hole was flexing inward 37% more than the design parameters. After we closed out, or started to close out some four-kilometer data, what I wanted to communicate really to the team was that uh, it's moving more than we thought. And so Brian Spencer's design and analysis report, the DAR predicts failure to be hoop failure on the inner surface at the center of the cylinder at about 2.21 times the design pressure. The DAR, which was 2.21 times the design pressure, was considered to be conservative. And we were deflecting about 37% higher than prediction, which is really important because the design basis for it was to constrain the movement at the center of the case. Look at this Spencer table for the first hull, based on 6,000 meters or 9,000 PSI with a collapse safety factor of 2.25x to 20,250 PSI and a cycle of dives predicted to be 1,000 to 10,000. In the Bahamas, it made about four deep dives and cracked, but it's hard to factor in the Bahamas lightning strike. But after this haul, Stockton did not trust Spencer to do another one, so they switched to using Electro Impact, which had experience in aerospace carbon fiber layups. Let's talk about another Spencer design decision that carried on to the second hull and was not following the recommendations of Boeing. Listen to Mark Nagley again. One of the statements of the report said, allowable strain tables do not support layups without plies oriented at the 45 degree direction. The final direction was constructed of only circumferential and axial plies, therefore there was no 45 degree plies in that final 
design of five inches thick. Was there any discussions with Ocean Gate about excluding the 45 degree plies? The material system and the production method that we had proposed, we did not have any allowables or supporting data uh, for anything that didn't have uh, 45 degree plies in the, in the laminate configuration. And can you briefly, ex briefly explain the potential importance of including 45 degree plies? I guess the thought would be that um, there's potential uh, for increased potential for damage or damage propagation based on um, the 090 configuration without a cross ply or that the uh, load redistribution if you had damage wouldn't wouldn't be um, wouldn't be performed as well or the, the the laminate might not be as robust as as it would be if it had 45 degree plies in there so Boeing gave OceanGate a prediction that a 7-inch hole would probably be needed, and they recommended plies at 45 degrees to distribute forces. And in part, these recommendations provided a safety factor to compensate for variances in manufacturing. But it was Spencer Composites that made the calculations that 5 inches was enough and that the fibers just needed to be laid down in two directions at 90 degrees to each other. There's 667 layers of carbon fiber in just a, what's called a 0-90 uh, axial and um, uh, rotational uh, layout, which is not normally done. But in the ocean, that's all you see. You don't get any torsional moments. The first hole failed because the five inches was laid down at one time, creating too many voids and weak layers. So when planning for the second hull, OceanGate got NASA involved for other ideas to make a stronger hull. NASA only worked remotely during the time of testing two one-third scale models. Both of these failed at less than the rated pressure, and neither of them practiced using the five-layer co-bonded technique that would be used on the second full-sized hull. Can you describe the third scale model testing? Uh, sure. They were not multi-cure. They were just single cure. We built two of them. The first scale model, we got to, and I can't remember the exact depth, but it was probably around 2,800 meters. And all of a sudden, we could see the strain start to move. And we could see the AE just go nuts. And then followed by an ear-splitting bang that you know, was you know ringing in the ears. and. Um, pretty pretty uh, catastrophic failure. And we tested the second uh, third scale model. It did not make it to the rated depth. Uh, he had us um, bring down the pressure um, once it was very clear that it was starting to fail. So, um, so it, it didn't fail, but it didn't make it to the, the depth that we wanted it to. You mentioned that you gave some advice remotely. Can you go into that a little bit more? During their one-third scale build, we provided a plan for them to try to fabricate that thick-walled cylinder. Our plan was mainly to, you know, lay down material, perform intermittent heat, heated debulks with pressure, you know, to accomplish the thickness that they were looking for. So that was, you know, the extent of our, of our recommendations. It was all fabrication related. And then Stockton stopped the NASA consultation early in the process, I assume when he learned what he wanted to know about autoclave debulking, and he let Electro Impact take over. NASA had to return a substantial amount of money. We received, um, it was roughly $40,000 for the, the remote consulting effort during the, uh, the one-third scale build. We returned close to $124,000 of that that 148. But here's the most amazing thing. Listen to this closely. NASA did not even care that they were working on a sub. Think about that. They're giving guidance on the laminate process, and OceanGate is following it, and no one is asking if this process was proper for a sub needing to tolerate 6,000 PSI over numerous cycles. Well, did you have experience with submersibles prior to working with OceanGate? No. So given the significant differences in pressure effects on spacecraft and submersibles, what rationale exists for NASA, NASA to lend its expertise to the development of submersibles? 
we weren't necessarily interested in the end application. We were interested in the thick walled composite for our applications that albeit they would have been loaded differently. We were interested in potential habitats, radiation shielding, um, you know, a number of other applications, not necessarily, um, a, 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 you know, hydrostatic um, submersible. The top block of hull is the cutoff end of the first hull. The bottom block of hull is the cutoff end of the version 2 hull, done in five layers, glued together. So how did OceanGate come to this design? It's probably because they learned from NASA about the process of autoclave debulking to remove voids and air pockets, but it can't work on a thick laminate. And Electro Impact simply refused to try to autoclave a 5-inch thick hull, knowing they could not trust the results. So by default, OceanGate was forced into the layered design glued together, completely untested for a submersible, and they did not even try this design with a one-third scale model test. It seems like this five-layer co-bonded design was backed into with no plans to fully test it other than one trip to the deep ocean test facility in Maryland for a few days of testing. Listen to the testimony of Phil Brooks, who was one of the engineers at OceanGate, when the second hull was being designed and built. Since you had stated earlier that the one-third scale models that were created by Electro Impact, they were not the same layup as the full-scale hull. Correct. Was there any discussion to do a third, third-scale model? That was discussed to do a multi-cure third scale, and Stockton did not want to do it for, for cost reasons, that um, it would be too expensive and was not needed. When it came time to do the full scale hull, Stockton did not want to do the multi-cure, and I believe that EI said that they would not build it. They would not build it without doing a multi-cure, that we, you know, we had to do it that way or take it, take it someplace else. So now the design and the fabrication of the hull is completely different. How did they know that the original strength predictions for a 5-inch hull by Spencer were still valid with this new co-bonded technique? I don't think they knew, or cared, because the priority was to use the original titanium rings. The ring, the titanium ring, glues onto that 5-inch section. That glue doesn't, doesn't come out. That, um, and that's how we did the... Um, Titan one, that's how the rings were removed. They were sawed off, and then the rings were milled out. And they were the same titanium rings that were used on version one and version two? That's correct. That's my understanding. Now it's time to take a good look at the technique used to make the five-layer co-bonded hull. Here's how Stockton talked about the co-bonded hull. But there's certain things that you want to be uh, buttoned down. So the pressure vessel is not MacGyvered at all because that's where we work with Boeing and NASA and the University of Washington. Everything else can fail. Your thrusters can go, your lights can go, you're still gonna be safe. The remainder of the video is about the construction process. Watch it and see if you can figure out how Stockton can say that with such assuredness. Dr. Kramer from the NTSB gave incredible testimony. He was responsible for analyzing the leftover end pieces of the hull after fabrication and also analyzing pieces recovered from the wreckage. He gives a nice description on how the hull was made. Let's listen to it. The head can apply multiple tapes in multiple directions. For the first two plies, the tapes were applied in the circumferential direction, like a spiral from one end of the hull to the other. For the third ply, the tapes were applied in the longitudinal direction. The sequence was then repeated until 133 plies, approximately one inch of prepreg material, had been applied to the hull. The hull then proceeded to curing and co-bonding. The co-bonding process, or multi-cure process, as it was sometimes referred to by OceanGate, involved building up the composite hull in one inch layer increments. After the first inch of prepreg was applied, the layer was capped by a peel ply. This peel ply was a plain woven synthetic fabric that was designed to be removed later. The assembly was then cured at elevated temperature and pressure in an autoclave. After curing, the peel ply was stripped from the surface. The act of stripping the peel ply is intended to create an active surface for adhesive bonding. After peel ply removal, bulges in the hole were removed by grinding. A layer of film adhesive was applied, followed by another inch of prepreg. 
capped once again by a peel ply. The assembly was once again sent to the autoclave for curing. This process was repeated until a nominally five inch thick hull was produced. And this is uh, an electro impact in Makotio using their big robotic carbon fiber placing arm. It would do a layer about an inch at a time in layer and it would go up to a facility called Janaki in Cedra Woolley to get baked and cured, send it back to another inch at a time over and over and over, uh, which took quite a while to do. So Dr. Kramer and the speaker from Ocean Gate make it sound easy, but it wasn't. After each layer, with the hull on the mandrel, it had to be taken off the winding machine and transported over an hour away to be put in the autoclave at Janaki, then transported back, add the layer of glue, reload it onto the winding machine, and add another layer of carbon fiber, then transported back to Janaki, and this was done five times. Do we know how the uncured light green adhesive was applied? Yeah, that is provided as a sheet or a film, and, and so it's, that's essentially how it's applied. It comes as a, a big sheet, and then it's just draped over the, um, over the hull. Besides the glue being a variable, what about the impact of multiple autoclave sessions? Let's concentrate on the process and then listen to a clip by Kemper Engineering. The first carbon layer gets autoclaved first. When the second carbon fiber layer and the first layer of glue gets debulked by autoclaving, the first layer of fiber is getting autoclaved the second time. When the third layer of carbon fiber is laid down, the first layer is now autoclaved three times and the first glue layer two times and so on. The effects of multiple autoclaving on the lower layers is not fully understood. Can you explain to me the additional stresses that may be developed in each layer as the whole would be cured over multiple cycles? There's a lot of unknowns here because it's so atypical of doing something this thick in five lifts, five, five layers. So potentially the additional cures could change, elevate the glassy temperature of the material such that it actually improves its ability to take temperature. By the same token, it also can be uh, putting additional stresses on the system uh, at, 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 depending on how, it, how it's taking the heat and whether it's contracting even more, but just even contracting a bit more in the heat fractionally, you could be developing differential stresses. Remember, all the predictions for the five inch thick V1 hull were from Spencer and the strength was grossly overrated. So again, who was the engineer that signed off on the five inch thick co-bonded V2 hull design? My fear is that OceanGate thought five inches is five inches, no matter how it's made. Sure, the V2 hull did survive four simulation dives to titanic depths in the deep ocean test facility in Maryland in March of 2021. After those four chamber tests, it was shipped to Newfoundland to start the 2021 season of titanic dives with no further testing. During the 2021 expedition, it reached the Titanic six times with an additional deep dive to about 3,400 meters. During the 2022 expedition, it reached the Titanic seven times and had an additional deep dive to around 3,000 meters. During the 2023 expedition, it never reached the Titanic and imploded. So if you include the four chamber dives in Maryland to Titanic depth pressure, this hull had a cycle life of 19 deep dives. The V2 hull was a one-off with no significant testing. Unfortunately, there was no regulatory body with authority in international waters to prevent OceanGate from diving with Titan.